Hello, everybody. I, um, I'm delighted to see everybody here. Thank you so much for, for being here. Um, and welcome to Grad Slam, final round. Um, my name is... Meg Luda Brown, uh, and I'm the Associate uh, Dean for uh, Professional Development in the Graduate College and Director of the Graduate Center, which is co-hosting this event along with the Graduate and Professional Student Council, whose president, uh, Luis Irizarry, is on stage with me. We have a really impressive slate of presenters this afternoon. Um, and in addition to the in-person competition um, and the award ceremony, you're, you'll soon learn uh, who the winners of the best recorded video presentations are. Click. Hello, everyone. Before we begin, I want to start by acknowledging that the, university is on, that the University of Arizona is on the land and territories of indigenous peoples. Today, Arizona is home to 22 federally recognized tribes, with Tucson being home to the Yotham and the Yaqui. Committed to diversity and inclusion, the university strives to build sustainable relationships with sovereign native nations and indigenous communities through education offerings, partnerships, and community service. For those of you who aren't familiar with Grad Slam, it's a campus-wide competition in which graduate students present their, their research or their creative work or other projects within a three-minute uh, time frame for a chance to win up to $3,000. Um, and since it's three minutes, um, the way we bill it is that you can earn $1,000 a minute, which is the only time you'll ever make as much as a basketball coach. Um, so, so the event is a really valuable professional development opportunity for students to enhance their communication skills for non-specialist audiences. It's also a really impressive demonstration of the innovative research and community engagement and creative contributions of graduate education at the University of Arizona. So for months in advance of Grad Slam, the Graduate Center offers many uh, professional development workshops on effective oral, visual, and written communication in order to help students prepare for the competition. And the event uh, offers students two opportunities. There's an in-person live presentation and a video presentation option, both of which uh, are really important platforms for communicating research to the public. Uh, we're, um, and this is, an, this is an, a really important detail. There's an increasingly uh, urgent need for all of us in higher education to communicate not only what we do, but why it's valuable. Um, and we need to do that in terms that policymakers and state legislators, families, potential employers, and the multiple communities that we serve can understand and appreciate. So speaking of appreciation, I think we have a, a slide to advance. Uh, yeah. uh, I want to thank our financial uh, supporters of Grad Slam. Their generosity provides incentive and recognition for students who participate in this professional development and communication opportunity. So many thanks to the University of Arizona Office of Research, Innovation, and Impact for supporting the, the grand prizes of the in-person Grad Slam competition every year since its inception. Thanks as well to Arizona Humanities for supporting our finalists' awards and to the Graduate and Professional Student Council for the Best Recorded Video Presentation Award. And so now it's my pleasure to introduce our uh, august panel of final round judges. These luminaries come from a variety of fields and, uh, and backgrounds, and they're going to evaluate and provide feedback on how well our finalists present their work to a non-specialist and informed audience, and they will determine the winners of the grand prizes. And I emphasize the feedback that they're going to provide because we have weeks and weeks of preliminary rounds in which judges um, give feedback to students uh, as well as a copy of the video of their presentation so that they can learn from um, what they're doing and, and, and improve it uh, from the feedback and from watching themselves. So the judges in alphabetical order are Dr. Betsy Cantwell, 
Senior Vice President for Research and Innovation at the University of Arizona, Dr. Liesl Folks, Provost and Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs at the University of Arizona, Cecilia Mata, Regent and Secretary on the Arizona Board of Regents, Brenda Thompson, Executive Director of Arizona Humanities, and Dr. Allison Titcomb, Chief Impact Officer and Senior Vice President of Community Development for the United Way of Tucson and Southern Arizona. Uh, judges. Thank you very, very much uh, for being here today. And I also want to express appreciation to the 21 in-person preliminary round judges and three video award judges who were critical in selecting which presenters moved to the final round and which uh, received the uh, video awards. All right, so now let's get to business. So we have a great program for you this evening, uh, and I'm gonna do a rundown of what it's gonna look like, uh, particularly and uh, what are the presenters going to be doing. So we're gonna have the competition. The format follows uh, three simple steps. Presenter is welcome to the floor and introduced by name and affiliation. Number two, presenters will then have three minutes uh, which starts when the presenter speaks or uses a hand gesture, and then the judges have three minutes to, compete, uh, to complete their uh, first impression of evaluations as well as their comments. Uh, we're going to repeat, repeat this process for all the presenters. In between presenters, uh, we will speak with them and ask a couple of questions, kind of like the same way we did in the preliminary rounds. And once all the scores are tallied, the judges will review the results, during which we plan to show the Grasslam uh, research story as a, in a video uh, modality. And then we're going to announce the winners of the Best Recorded Video Presentation Award, as well as what you've been waiting for, the grand prizes. So with that, uh, let's get this starting started. Let's begin the competition. Our first presenter is Grace Heffernan. She's a master's student in the biomedical engineering program. Grace, you have the floor. Hello. Hello. Okay, cool. Imagine you're in high school, running down the soccer field at full speed. Your lungs burn and legs ache with each movement. But you don't care. Nothing matters more than running and winning. Flash forward six months. You're tired, breathless, and bleacher sprints are a lot harder than you remember. You tell yourself it's just a phase, that you haven't been practicing enough in the off season. Tomorrow, you'll be back to normal. Suddenly, you wake up in the hospital. Not sure how you got there. Your parents are crying as the doctor tries to talk to you. But you stopped listening at the words, life-threatening heart disease. Any second now, you'll wake up from this nightmare. Genetic cardiomyopathy affects one in 500 people worldwide and is the leading cause of sudden cardiac death. This disease causes heart muscle to stretch and thicken, reducing the heart's ability to pump blood efficiently to the rest of the body. It's caused by abnormal genes or mutations that change the shape of heart muscle and proteins. Now, despite its severity, there's currently no cure for genetic cardiomyopathy, and the medication that is available only acts to relieve a patient's pain without dealing with the cause of the condition. A main question stopping drug development is how do these mutations actually change heart muscle? The question can only be answered if we know the organization and movements of the proteins that make up a normal heart. Unfortunately, we do not yet fully understand the structure of cardiac proteins that are affected by these genetic mutations. In my research, I focus on defining the structure of one of these proteins, troponin T. And to do this, I use a technique known as fluorescence resonance energy transfer or as I like to call it, FRET. 
FRET acts as a molecular ruler that uses the energy from light to measure the distance between two proteins. First, I place a molecule that gives off energy when hit by light onto troponin T. Then, I shine a light on this molecule, which causes the energy to be transferred to a different protein in the heart. This transfer of energy allows me to measure the distance between these two proteins. So why? Why does this matter? Knowing the distance that troponin T is from other proteins in a healthy heart helps us piece together muscle structure. Once we know this, we can then identify where mutations change the structure and create medications that target these areas. Patients suffering from genetic cardiomyopathy have a wake up from their nightmare. Understanding distance changes between proteins in a healthy heart will bring us one step closer to finding a cure that wakes them up. Thank you. Thank you so much for this uh, wonderful presentation. So uh, while the judges you know, do their uh, scoring and, and brief deliberation, in the preliminaries, there was a little interview of like, how do you got into university, what do you expect? But I've been tasked to add a little bit of randomness to the interview, so I'm going to ask you a question that has nothing to do with anything that you've spoken or whatever. Okay. Uh, so <laughs> let me see. A classic one. If you, have, if you, if you were granted three wishes, what would they be? Uh, to pass my defense. <laughs> what? Um, that's the top of my priorities right now. Um, <laughs> to not wreck my car again. It's happened, sorry dad, happened twice in the last year. Um, and then uh, probably just for my family and friends to stay healthy and safe. So... Perfect. That's great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next presenter is Kevin Rotado. He's a doctoral student in the pharmacology and toxicology program. Testing, testing. I don't think so. Is it? Testing, testing. It's a world without acute kidney injury attainable. Acute kidney injury, AKI, also known as acute kidney failure, is commonly defined as the rapid loss of kidney function. AKI kills 300,000 people in the US every year. It is a huge burden for patients and their families, resulting in $9 billion for its treatment every year. It is not exclusive of the US. In fact, it kills 1.7 million people worldwide every year. About 85% of all AKI cases happen in developing countries, like my country of origin, Mexico, on which 25% of all AKI cases result in death. AKI can be acquired outside the hospital or after being admitted by a different reason, such as surgery. It doesn't discriminate against age, nationality, race, or sex. It could happen to me, to a family member. It could happen to you. In context, the kidney, the second most energy demanding organ of the body, keeps you alive by removing waste from you. It filters a liter of blood every hour, and to do this, it requires a lot of energy. That's why it has a lot of mitochondria, as you might remember from Biology 101 as the powerhouse of the cell. The kidney is very, is, is very sensitive to mitochondria health um, dysfunction. Sadly, AKI, it is very aggressive or harmful for mitochondria. In fact, it induces mitochondrial dysfunction. It is a key uh, mediator for its progression. This means no energy, leading to kidney failure, accumulation of toxins, and even increased risk of death. AKI, despite the incidence being increased in the last two decades, there's still yet no FDA-approved treatment for it. This has pushed a lot of people to believe that a world without kidney disease 
is impossible. However, in the Schnellman lab, we are prevailing. Wouldn't it be amazing to use one of the 19,000 approved FDI drugs for the treatment of AKI? In fact, we can. Repurposing an FDI approved drug that has been approved for something like a migraine or asthma for acute kidney injury would significantly expedite the research necessary to consider it safe. That is the core of my project, repurposing an FDI approved drug for the treatment of AKI. And with great effort in an AKI model, I have been successful to induce mitochondrial biogenesis, the production of new and functional mitochondria. More mitochondria means more energy, restoring kidney function, decreasing accumulation of toxins, and ultimately decreasing the risk of death. Hopefully, with this together, I have convinced you that we are one step closer where a world with a kidney disease becomes attainable. Si se puede. Thank you for attention. Thank you so much, Kevin, for this presentation. So uh, uh, I don't know if you were hearing on the other room, but uh, same deal. There was a brief interview in the preliminaries in which I spoke, I, I talked about how do you get into the university, what do you expect to graduate, and so forth. But uh, now I'm going to add a little bit of randomness to this uh, brief interview to give the, some time to the judges. So if you could erase one moment from history, which moments would you erase and why? Oh, the first time I paid my taxes on my own. <laughs> oh. And what, 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 would you, what would you change it for? Oh, I made a little mistake, but I ended up fixing it. <laughs> oh. tell, tell, tell me more. Oh, uh, uh, I don't know if someone from the IRS is here, so... <laughs> okay, okay. Let me, let me think somebody. No, I, I need to get that information somehow. Let okay. me ask you another question. Um... <laughs> Let me see. If you could be the president of the University of Arizona for one day, what changes would you make? You only have one day. I only have one day? Yeah, one day. Oh. From now to tomorrow. Random lunch of faculty members with students. Okay. Random assignation of like any professor with any student. So. I guess one of the beauties of the University of Arizona is that I get to know people from all kinds of world, all kinds of part of the world, plus all kinds of uh, ideologies. And I think that's something that inspires me and humbles me to keep open, a open-minded. And I think everybody could be benefit from that. Thank you so much, Kevin. next presenter is Abigail Schwartz, who is a doctoral student in the Neuroscience Graduate Interdisciplinary Program. Abigail, you have the floor. Twenty point five percent of the U.S. adult population suffers from chronic pain. The most common treatment for this are opioid medications, which are effective at relieving pain, but also incredibly addictive. Because of this, more individuals are turning to cannabis in order to manage their chronic pain. Now, cannabis has a lot of different chemicals in it, and I'm gonna talk about one of those today called beta caryophyllin or BCP. Why is it important to find alternatives to opioid-based pain therapies? I mentioned they're addictive, but they can also be fatal. More than five people lose their lives every day from opioid overdose in Arizona alone. Our lab is asking the question, can the cannabis terpene BCP be used in conjunction with opioid medications in order to create safer and more effective pain therapies? Now to do this, we poke mouse feet. Now this typically doesn't bother the mouse, but if you or someone you know has gone through chemotherapy, you know that tactile stimuli can become painful and it's the same for our mice. After our mice get chemotherapy, we'll give them the opioid drug morphine, which causes pain relief. 
We tried giving them the cannabis terpene, BCP, which caused a similar level of pain relief to that of the morphine. We found that when we combined the two, the mice had enhanced pain pit therapy more than either drug alone. Now, this is exciting, but we needed to determine if BCP was rewarding and therefore potentially addictive. To do this, we allowed the mice to explore two rooms. Typically, they don't care which room they're in, but if we introduce an opioid, the mouse will spend more of their time in that room because it's rewarding. However, when we gave them the terpene BCP, the mouse spent most of the time in the opposite room, showing that it is aversive. When we combined both the opioid and BCP, the mouse no longer had a preference between rooms, showing that this combination decreased the reward of the opioid, the aversion of the BCP, leading to better overall pain therapy. To summarize, BCP alone causes pain relief. Combining it with opioids led to increased pain relief more than either drug alone. Decrease the addiction potential of the opioid, leading to safer and more effective pain therapies. Now, I'm so excited to share this work with you all, but this isn't stopping opioid overdoses from happening today. I want to mention one more drug, naloxone, which can reverse opioid overdoses, and I have pamphlets with information about organizations around Tucson that will provide free naloxone to you. So please take one of those on your way out, and thank you all so much for your time. Thank you so much for this presentation. Uh, so you probably heard my spiel through Kevin that I'm going to switch a little bit the interview and I'm going to ask uh, random questions awesome. uh, instead of usual questions. So um, let me see. Any ideas? No, I have one. Um, let me see. I asked about president of the university, but what if you could be the governor of uh, the state of Arizona for one day? What things you would change? Real quick. <sighs> Uh, I guess with this presentation, make naloxone more available, put more funding in it, and decriminalize homelessness. Give more support to the homeless community. Um, now let me go back to the usual questions. So other <laughs> than graduating, uh, what, is, what is another goal that you have uh, uh, with the university to complete before you graduate, other than, than earning the degree? Uh, uh, with the university, my first thought when you said a goal that I have right now would be rock climbing. I want to be able to climb a, a 12A, flash it. So that's, <laughs> but that's apart from the university. Um, one of my goals would be to really leave behind good, uh, st like students that I've mentored, really leave them with skills that they can take into their next phase so they're able to meet their goals. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Our next presenter is Enrique Olivares Perraro. He's a doctoral student in the geography program. Enrique, you have the floor. The United States is in the midst of a mass incarceration crisis with 2.2 million people in our prisons and over 10 million people cycling through our jails every single year. Right here in Arizona, we have the eighth highest rate of incarceration in the whole world. Our state punishes so many people that one out of every 11 Arizonans has a felony conviction on their record. My name is Enrique Alano Olivares Pelayo, and I study prisons. I map the human cost of mass incarceration, or carcerality, in our state. More than just a fancy term for the geography of prisons, carceral geography theorizes and makes meaning about sites of containment, confinement, and coercive control. 
Because how can we map intangibles like exclusion, stigma, and shame? Where do we find or how can we define invisible boundaries and borders in our carceral state? Answering these questions requires new ways of knowing and novel methods of research in geography. Allow me to reintroduce myself. I am inmate number 264962. I spent four years in prison, and I will never forget my number. My release date from prison was over eight years ago, but what I and so many others in Arizona continue to experience is that prison is not merely a place where we resided. It's a place that still resides within us, because a part of that prison system travels inside of us now, embodied as a dormant way of being and a potential for going back that ensnares one out of every three people who do make it out because the state never forgets our number either. And the punishment spaces of the prison system are not confined by the limits on prison gates. Instead, by branding us as felons, the state ensures that upon our release, everywhere becomes an extension of the penitentiary. Every loan application, school enrollment form, and interview on the lease for an apartment becomes an embodied carceral geography, a place where prison manifests within free society through our bodies. Like right here, right now. Thus, my research analyzes and codes the data contained within lived experiences of incarceration to map both the scale and the scope of Arizona's carceral crisis. Because we will not end injustice, hunger, and poverty through banishment, punishment, and chains. We cannot make our society more equitable through violence, handcuffs, and more cages for human beings. My research seeks better answers for these challenges that we collectively face, and they must be rooted in human dignity and mutual respect. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, so I'm sorry for the audience. I know I'm repeating the spiel a couple of times, but uh, in the preliminaries, you were asked some uh, basic questions about do you research and the universities, but I'm going to ask uh, questions that have nothing to do with that, uh, that are completely random. So uh, number one, if money was not a problem, uh -huh. uh, how would you spend your time? If money was not a problem, I don't, I think I would change anything about how I spend my time. I would exercise and eat healthy and spend time with my loved ones. Thank you for the support and uh, continue to, to do my best to mitigate the, the violence impacted on so many lives by our criminal punishment system. Perfect. And now even more random, uh, of all the objects items that you have, what is the most useful one that you think you have? For in uh, my case, it's a frying pan. Yeah, I mean, the most useful object I have is uh, my palm uh, hair shaver <laughs> that collects uh, all the hair as it buzzes so I don't have to, you know, pick up after myself too much. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you all. Our next presenter is Gabby Wynn. She's a doctoral student in the Applied Intercultural Arts Research Graduate Interdisciplinary Program. Gabby, you have the floor. last summer studying art, ethnography, and pedagogy. When I was there, I met Adonia, 
a 90-year-old woman who has limited mobility. She expressed a desire to visit the monasteries in her village, where she used to spend a lot of time. After learning this, I brought my 360-degree camera, went on a hike around the village, filmed several monasteries along the way, edited footage, and uploaded it to my VR headset. Later, I showed the film to Adonia, who had never before used a VR headset. She was amazed that she could visit the monasteries again in such an immersive way, and was so overjoyed that she thanked me by hugging me a lot. <laughs> we all know that the world population is aging rapidly, and in the next 30 years, the number of people over 60 is expected to nearly double from 12% to 22%. Dementia is a significant concern for this aging population, with an estimated 55 million people currently living with the condition in the world. Unfortunately, many people with dementia spend their final years in nursing facilities, like memory care, where safety and physical concerns often restrict residents from leaving the premises, not to mention traveling. My PhD study focuses on developing person-centered, creative aging methods using innovative technologies and the arts to promote quality of life, advance autonomy and human rights, and also address social isolation of older adults living with dementia. I am currently conducting a pilot study at a memory care facility with five participants aged 79 to 95 who are experiencing various stages of dementia. Each week, they watch a 360-degree film of their choice, featuring any location worldwide, accompanied by their preferred music. I am using the participatory action approach, which gives participants ownership and a voice in the study. The participants are not only subjects I am studying, but also my collaborators. In the future, my goal is to establish a nationwide creative aging program that trains caregivers in nursing facilities to use technology to assist older adults living with dementia. I believe technology should not have an age limit on who it can benefit. It should empower and enhance the lives of every generation, like opening up a world that would otherwise have been beyond reach for people like Adonia. Thank you. No, no, I'm not going to say the spiel again. Uh, but as you may have heard, I'm asking uh, questions that are not necessarily involved in the research. Um, so I'm going to step away from random as it's still a little bit random, but what are two things that you think that everyone must do in their life that they have to do? They, they cannot go away without doing them. Two things. Um, traveling and reading. Maybe. <laughs> What's a good place to travel? To read? Sorry? What's a good place to travel and read? Um, personally, I think New Zealand. Because I've been to New Zealand and I love it there. It's so pure. It's like the heaven of our world. So, And it's where they shot the Lord of the Rings. So, yeah. <laughs> So, and now on, on that same note, what are two things on your bucket list that you would like to do in the upcoming years? Hmm, that's a Other than graduating, because we all want to do that, and we must do that. Um, sorry, can you repeat the question? <laughs> what are two things on your bucket list, two mm -hmm. things that you want to do in the upcoming years that you're really looking forward to do? I really want to retire in New Zealand. <laughs> That's the answer I was looking for. Yeah. And I don't know, travel around the world, I think. Yeah, perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you. And our final presenter is Colin Gillespie. 
He's a doctoral student in the Natural Resource Management and Watershed Management and Eco-Hydrology Program. Colin, you have the floor. My name is Colin Gillespie, and today I want to talk a little about my research on the water use patterns of repairing mesquite trees. First, I'm going to talk a little about mesquite more broadly and some context before getting into some of the specifics of my project. Now, mesquite are incredibly flexible, adaptable, and hardy species. Here's a classic lowland watershed like you see in the areas around Tucson. And mesquite can be found pretty much everywhere here, including in the upland scrub, lining the washes, and down in the river terrace just out from the cottonwoods and the willows. Like the highlighted area in this image, areas bordering a water body like the stream are referred to as riparian. And it's the mesquite in these areas that are of principal interest to our project. Mesquite can be vilified and are sometimes blamed for declines in stream flow seen in many waterways throughout the Southwest. So land managers sometimes turn to expensive and destructive mesquite removal projects in attempts to mitigate that decline. Yes, maybe it's true that mesquite are not as huggable as some trees. But it's not clearly established that the removal would have that desired effect. And so it's in this context that we're studying the water use patterns of riparian mesquite along the lower San Pedro River. We're trying to determine the source water used by different stands of mesquite, and that would be able to let us see if, we can, if, the, water, if the trees are using water that might otherwise contribute to stream flow. We're also asking, does water use patterns vary between mature stands and younger thickets? Does it vary between different times of the year? And how does this impact tree water stress? Here you can see some images from some of our test plots. We're studying a mature forest, a high-density young thicket, a low-density young thicket, as well as an upland, pl stop, upland, pl upland plot that declined to have its photo taken, so it's not pictured here. <laughs> we collect samples from each of our plots of both the trees and the shallow soils, and then we extract the water from those samples. Then we analyze that water to determine its isotopic signature so that we can see which water sources the trees are using, and when. And what we're seeing is that the different stands of mesquite use, have very similar patterns, in that they mostly use uh, water from the upper couple layers of soil, depending on the available moisture. Through the spring and into the early summer, they begin to draw water from deeper down as those shallower soil layers dry out. Then, once those sweet monsoon rains come, they shift back to using those shallow soil layers at least until the winter, when they begin to drop their leaves and go dormant until the following spring. So thinking back to stream flow, if the mosquito are only relying on higher levels of water and not the deeper, then it's likely their impact on stream flow would be negligible, if any at all, at least during drier, or I'm sorry, during wetter years, like during my study period. If any of you are interested in this project and or want to join me for some field work, especially this summer when it gets nice and toasty, feel free to reach out. A big thanks to Jahu, Gita Bodner, the Nature Conservancy, and all of you for your attention. Thank you so much. Uh, no, no, I'm not gonna say a spiel, just a little bit. Uh, so, as you heard, I've been asking questions that are not related to the research, uh, mm -hmm. and I'm going to ask again the very first one. What are uh, if you could have three wishes, what would they be? Okay, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, three wishes. I mean, I want a boat, like a sailboat. Not like a, not like a big yacht, like a modest, a modest sailboat. Because I want to I wanna live on a boat 60, for a little while. 60 feet, 80 feet? 60 seems ambitious, but I mean, yeah, I mean, that'd be fine. <laughs> I wouldn't say no boat, you know, or 60. Yeah, no, that's fine. Um, wish number two, somebody teach me how to use that boat. That's going to be crucial because I don't, I don't know how to sail at all. So well, 15 that, years ago, I, 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 I took a navigation course. I may remember a thing or two. I can, I okay, can well, yeah, I mean, then I'll save, that, I'll save that wish, and then I'll use it for, um, oh, gosh, I don't know. I'm only thinking of material things right now, but I'd like to own an island. Where? I mean, and then not a big one, also modest. It doesn't have to be real big or even fancy. 50 miles? 
Yeah, that seems plenty. That seems plenty. Even My hometown is 100, so yeah. Yeah, and then I guess slightly more practical, I, I would wish for a job that would allow me to do work that would be fulfilling and have ample free time to be able to do stuff I enjoy, hang out with people I like hanging out with or something like that. I think that's, that's pretty attainable. That, that is the wish right there. Uh, let me see. Thanks. <laughs> So one last question, very random. Uh, if you could be invisible, what are some of the things that you would do? Yeah, that's, that's random. Uh, yeah. Audience, audience uh, is Appropriate. Here. Appropriate, yeah. Appropriate, yeah. Um, oh, geez, I mean, that's a solid question. Um, I, I, I would want to see how I think everybody has little habits of certain ritualistic things that they do. Now, no, this is, th no, geez, oh, no, the only example I can think of is not ideal. Um, okay, so uh, how about this, how about this? Like, maybe probably everybody has a technique uh, that they use to fold their laundry, and you don't really learn it from anybody. You just develop your own technique, and you kind of, you know, it just, like, evolves on its own. And I only know what mine looks like. I don't know what anybody else's looked like. So maybe I'd want to like see those sorts of little rituals that people have in their day-to-day -day life. That's different yes. from my method. You know what I mean? That's maybe I can pick answer. up some tips. That's Something the real like that. answer. Thank you so much. Thank Another you. round of applause. So good. So good. Okay, this concludes the presentation portion of the Grad Slam final, and it concludes uh, uh, Luis's torturing of the uh, presenters. So I want to thank the students for their presentations, and I want to thank the judges very much for, um, for their evaluations. So for the next 15 minutes or so, the judges are going to adjourn to the deliberation room in order to review the scores and determine which presenters will win the grand prizes. And so while they confer, Luis and I get to tell you a little bit about the work that we do on behalf of graduate education. So I'll start. Um, as many of you know, the Graduate Center is the professional development arm of the Graduate College, and we offer programs and resources and opportunities that include writing support, uh, interpersonal communication and public speaking, wellness initiatives, mentoring, career services, conflict negotiation, financial literacy and educational debt management, combating imposter syndrome, networking skills, and a lot, lot more. We put on dozens and dozens and dozens of programs each semester and throughout the summer. And over 3,000 graduate students um, attend our programs each year. And in addition, we incorporate um, professional development opportunities into all of our student staff positions, so the graduate assistants who work for us in the Graduate Center. And the graduate assistants, Luke Wink Moran and Sam Masango, took wonderful advantage of just such an opportunity when they recently created um, a video that explores the impact of Grad Slam from the perspective of past finalists. And so we're very excited to share with you their work uh, while today's Grad Slam judges uh, deliberate. So here it is. Hope you enjoy it. Aloha kako, o Kiana ko inoa no Hilo Mayao. My name is Kiana. I am from Hilo, Hawaii, and I am the product of a thousand generations of storytellers who lived so that I could be here today. An opportunity to win a thousand dollars for every minute while presenting your research as a graduate student. Gretzlam. This is Grad Slam. It's a national research competition in which graduate students can enter their research and compete for a grand prize. Three rounds of presentations, three minutes per presentation, $3,000 to the winner, which in this case is Kiana. We were lucky enough to talk to Kiana about her Grad Slam journey. And we also got in touch with a few previous champions and talked to them about their own experiences. But before we get to that. Let's step back a bit, a little bit, right? <laughs> back, way back to when you first found out 
about this thing called Grad Slam. How did I hear about Grad Slam? I think that I initially heard about it by uh, taking this course that's called Survival Skills and Ethics. I had a friend who was a university fellow, and for them, they were required to do the Grad Slam. So she was in our circles, and she was like, okay, all of us need to do the Grad Slam. I think it was right before spring break. Um, I think um, <laughs> someone had like forwarded the email and was like, don't forget to sign up, like you have one more day. And I was like, oh, like I, I thought about this, but I like didn't sign up. But I felt like I had um, something to say that I haven't gotten the opportunity to share with like people outside of my discipline. But scientific research can be very complex, of course, to explain, um, especially to a lay audience. The research I used for Grad Slam was part of my PhD dissertation. It was about connected vehicle technology. My research was ultimately about better understanding the mechanism of opiates. If I recall, it was something like uncovering the spectral fingerprint of disease. Can you explain um, the Talk Stories project to us a bit? Yeah, um, so uh, Talking Stories is a, like I said in my presentation, it's a Pacific Islander practice uh, that kind of originated out of like when I was talking about the plantation society. So when all of these immigrants were coming in, they had they brought their languages and their cultures with them, and they had to find a way to communicate, you know, with one another against the um, like the the colonizers essentially, you know, like and so um, pidgin or Hawaiian Creole English is what kind of evolved out of the blending of those languages. Mm -hmm. And the concept of talking stories is literally after the long day of working on the plantation, mm -hmm. all of these people would come together and stay on the porch and share their culture and share their food, and share their stories, and mm -hmm. literally just sit and talk stories. And the reason why it's, it's talk stories, that's um, pigeon instead of talking stories. Um, it, it's kind of interchangeable, but mm -hmm. people on, in Hawaii would be like, let's talk stories. The Talk Stories Research Project and the rest of these projects all have one thing in common. They're specialized, complex, and hard to explain. So how does one boil a complex research project down into a three minute presentation? And why does one bother? I think that within every single research field, maybe not every scientist, but at least within every field, there's a responsibility to teach others, to disseminate um, the findings that you know, we find in science to, so in a way that other people can understand. It's going to be difficult. Like, why? Because they said, you only have three minutes to tell your story. I was like, I've been working in this in my PhD, for example, for like four years, and you want me to tell you what I do in only three minutes? The time you have is, is really tricky. The first thing I did was go and watch a bunch of videos about three-minute thesis competitions, since that's essentially the same thing. Um, I tried to identify what the people did that I thought they did well, what they did that they didn't do so well. Um, and I also actually read a couple of books on effective scientific speaking and effective communication. So the graduate college is really intentional about the Grad Slam because there were about 10 sessions where there was a speaker who came and taught us different things, the preparation of the slides, the, de the presentation of the talk, the right uh, choices of words to use. Like the whole process came together bit by bit until we finally got to present for the first round. I didn't get to attend the training sessions just because I signed up so late, which I don't recommend. Um, but I did scroll through all of the links on the website, which was super helpful, particularly the one um, it was like it was a YouTube video of like tips for the three minute thesis winner and that presentation was really wonderful. Uh, she only used one slide and it was a blank white screen. I read through a bunch of the articles as well um, regarding like how to format. Uh, a lot of them said tell a story in the beginning, um, which was very fitting. My words were kind of unstructured at that point, so it helped me structure it and tailor it towards the rubric, which had a large component on is the research clear? Is the questions clear? Um, are, are you articulating like the conclusions and claims? And you got to realize like, and the purpose of this speech is not to train other people to do your research. It's to educate and inspire them regarding your research. What was the first round like for you? Imagine putting my, at that time it was maybe five, six years of research into six slides. I have tons of photos that I have taken over the years. So trying to decide which is really good, which is really 
good enough to tell this story. I was like, oh my God, it all feels like a whole different kind of competition altogether. <laughs> After the first iteration of my presentation, I had put so much like effort and time into it that when I received the feedback, I was kind of like overwhelmed. Like I was hit with the reality like, oh, I, I have to make some big changes. After the presentations, you will get back like the paper form where they filled. And so there were judges who you could tell just loved what you did. Like you have like a five star rating on everything. And then there was that one judge who you did not impress at all. Very <laughs> yes, very critical. And when you think about it, you're like, actually, it makes sense. I really appreciated um, all of the feedback and the critiques from the judges. And in the preliminary rounds, their suggestions really helped me to optimize my presentation and give me more confidence moving forward. In the second round, I started joining the, the sessions, the tutorial sessions that Grad Islam was putting together. There were some info sessions and some sorts of workshops that helped the presenters to do a better job. Uh, and those tutorial sessions um, helped me a lot, helped me enormously uh, on how to breathe on stage, how to talk when you're telling a story. And it all goes down to this concept of being able to tell a proper story. You know the demigod Maui, right? Yeah. Maui is present in a bunch of Pacific Islander cultures throughout the whole Pacific, um, including the Philippines. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing about Maui is there's this one story where he's fishing out the islands, right, with his fish hook. Mm -hmm. And one that you might see that as like a metaphor for like that how the islands came to be. But it also suggests another layer where Pacific Islanders knew that the earth was round even before Western culture did. Because as you're sailing in the canoe and you see the islands come up, that's an indicator of the earth being round, right? And then when you're departing, it seems to go back into the ocean. And so that story is a way of articulating the technology and science that was occurring in those Pacific Islander cultures in order to connect, you want to tell a story, right? You don't want to just say, this is my research and this is what I did. You, we often start by saying, you know, like you, you, you want to relate. And mm -hmm. that's what, to me, the heart of storytelling is the relations that are built. What was the most memorable or most exciting part of all this whole Great Slum journey? Oh. <laughs> I really think the finals. So to get ready for the final round, I would go running in the morning. And then while I was running, I would like recite it in my head, like lung on a chip is all, you know, I like have my eyes closed. While I was running and trying to get things going. And, um, and that was good. Just helped me get like all the nerves out. I just would practice it over and over and over and over. I practiced it probably hundreds of times uh, leading up to it. And, um, it, it became almost like a, a competition with myself to make it as good as I possibly could. For the final round, up till, till, till when I started, I had not told my family about it. And I remember my dad called me and I told him, oh my God, no, we can't talk now because I'm getting ready you know, to do this. And he was like, to do what again? And I'm telling him, okay, so there's the grand slam and then there's the first round, so to, tonight is the final round. My dad tells me, okay, since you've decided to tell me this, go and make me proud. So there you are, walking into the Environmental Sciences Building on the 24th of March, 2022, looking for Grad Slam for the Grad Slam venue. Take us through the events of that morning and paint us a picture of your experience right until your name was called out. So I was very nervous um, and walking in, I kind of didn't know who I was like up against. I didn't know like the rigor of everyone and like their projects. And so when I walked in, it was like completely silent and, and that like <laughs> made me more nervous. But <laughs> honestly, um, you were kind of like joking around, which like helped calm my nerves. But during the presentations, I just kind of tried to breathe um, and run through it a couple of times in my head. And then when my name was called, I just like blacked out. As soon as they called my name, I was like, the only thing was in my mind was, it's to be or not to be. This is my only chance. You already knew when you hear that, it's now or die. But as soon as I walked up to the, the front or the stage, I saw like my, my presentation up and I was like, oh, I, I remember like why I'm here. And a lot, of, a lot of times when I'm nervous, I'll remember 
that I am a culmination of an entire lineage and history that came before me. I, I told myself like this, this small three minutes of my life is a way of honoring my past um, by bringing them with me into that space. So I performed. Kiana's wasn't the only excellent performance given that day. In fact, when the contestants lined up to receive their awards, some of them weren't even thinking about the grand prize. I wasn't thinking about the placings. I was just like so overwhelmed with joy and honor that I could finally, you know, present what I'm passionate about in a way where people are like, oh, I can, I can connect and I can yeah. see like why that's important and it, why it matters. I was just blown away when we won. I was, I, cause they're all great presentations. I think that's the thing that was crazy is after everyone's presentation, I was so expi so excited about everyone else's research. I was like, oh my gosh, they're doing that. Like, this is, this is so cool. This is impactful. Like they're helping kids that, you know, aren't native English. Speakers. Like there's so many things I was like, everyone's got cool research. And then when it, when it landed on me, I was like, oh my gosh, this is such an honor. Um, it, it was really, really crazy. Um, honestly, just like, Whew. But what did you learn uh, from participating in Grad Slam? I definitely learned a lot more about my strengths as a student and as a scientist. I learned uh, really about how little I knew in this field, um, how little I knew about you know, creating a good presentation. Actually, it impacted my life a lot to the point that now I'm not exaggerating, like Grad Slam made me explain everything that I know to anyone as simple as possible. Because I believe in, as I told you before, if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. As a fact, it helped me a lot for during my presentations after I joined uh, different companies uh, after graduation. But Something more personal for me was that I had a passion all my life um, and I never got a chance to, to do it. Uh, and it was a stage acting. But and I never, the problem was that I never had the time or the energy or the excitement or basically that, that extra push to, to go outside of my comfort zone and try what I always loved to do. Um, after graduation, and mainly because of the experience I gained through Grad Slam journey, uh, I was able to go out there and start auditioning for different different plays that are happening here uh, in the Bay Area, and that opened a lot of doors to me. So, is, is there anything else you'd want to tell us about your Grad Slam experience? Yeah, I don't know why other students don't want to do this. <laughs> Everyone should just do this. It is good for you. It, it makes you grow. You, practice, you gain a lot of confidence. Mm -hmm. And in the process, you are able to know what your research is about. If you're nervous or afraid, just get pushed out of your comfort zone a little bit. That's how we grow. History repeats itself, right? It's always a continuation or a transition of something that has already existed. And so in terms of storytelling, in our indigenous cultures, we tend to see it as very circular instead of linear. So it doesn't go from point A to point B to C and it ends. Mm -hmm. It's spiraling and continuing into the future, into the past, into the present. And so everything come back, comes back to the story in the sense that it is our origin. We are tied to the land because of it. And you can it's easy to say like everything is story, but it, it really is a, a part of humanity uh, and it connects us back to our origins and also to our future which is being born right now. Take two, action. Hello Diana, welcome. Thank you for uh, being with us here and uh, would you please introduce yourself to us? Will that be hard? Wait for it. Yes. How do you describe yourself in three words? <laughs> <laughs> That's a really tough question. Um, Jackhammer? <laughs> I would say... <laughs> He's going. Keep your... 
And that's all our questions. Oh my Woo! gosh. <laughs> yeah, do you have anything else? Is there anything else you want to add? I know I hate that question. <laughs> I, I feel like we got a lot I of think content. We got it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah think we, we got a lot. We did. Yeah. We're good. <laughs> that was so nerve wracking. That was amazing. Thank you. Would you please pull up the house lights uh, so that we can um, see Sam and Luke stand and we can pay homage to their work? <laughs> Sam and Luke, there they are. Yes. Now we're going to begin the award ceremony, which is what we've all been waiting for. Uh, so uh, we'll have the official announcement, who's going to be uh, the winners of the Grad Slam Best Recorded Video Presentation, are, and which are the finalists will take home the grand prizes for the in-person competition. In addition to these prizes, the finalists will automatically shortlist to represent the University of Arizona at the Western Association of Graduate School's three-minute thesis competition, a regional presentation similar to Grad Slam. So please, a round of applause for all of our participants. So this year, uh, the Graduate and Professional Student Council uh, sponsored the Best Recorded Video Presentation Award, uh, GPSC sponsoring the awards and offering a first, second, and third prizes. Uh, and let me talk a little bit about the Graduate and Professional Student Council. I promise I won't take too much of your time. Uh, so the Graduate and Professional Student Council has been in the University of Arizona for about 30 years. Uh, part of our mission statement is to promote the social, economic, uh, and academic aims of graduate and professional students in the University of Arizona. And uh, one of those three is uh, very prominent these days, which is the economic aspect, and that is something that this year in particular, GPSE has been focusing on, uh, getting uh, better financial circumstances for graduate students. Uh, but we also expand our uh, reach to make sure that graduate and professional students have a voice in the university. Uh, because that was one of the aims of the Graduate and Professional Student Council when it was being created. And this year we've accomplished uh, a couple good things. Uh, we've launched several new grants and we currently offer grants for students to travel and uh, give presentations uh, in respective conferences to take uh, their licensing exams, which is the bar or med school uh, exams. And most of, most of these things are focusing on the economic aspect because it's one of the things that me as president, we constantly get uh, that the financial circumstances of grad students are uh, not, the, not the most ideal. And we do what we can to help our fellow students. Uh, so yeah, that is in a nutshell what GPSC does. Uh, we're gonna have elections soon, so stay tuned in your emails. You're gonna get a lot of them soon. Uh, not from me, but from other people related in GPSC. So uh, now let's start with the awards, uh, the video awards. So to be eligible for this award, students had to create three minute videos about their work. Uh, judges from across the university and the community reviewed the videos using the Grad uh, Slam scorecard to determine which of the presenters were the most effective in communicating the work to a non-specialist and asynchronous audience. So, without further ado, let us find out who won these uh, video awards. So, our first announcement uh, is an honorable mention. Our judges felt strongly that this individual did an outstanding job and should receive recognition. Our video award honorable mention is for Thomas Furr, a doctor. <laughs> I believe Thomas is, uh, won't, uh, wasn't able to join us uh, this evening, but he's a doctoral student in transcultural German studies, and uh, we're accepting the award on his behalf. So, the third uh, place winner is uh, Becky Fabriardi. Uh, uh, Becky is here with us. Bekti is a uh, master's student in teaching English as a second language, uh, and I have a certificate to offer. 
Congratulations. So, I know, first, third. Now let's hear the second place. So the second place winner is Brian Wong. <laughs> Brian is a doctoral student in speech, language, and hearing sciences. So congratulations, Brian. Thank you. And now for the first place uh, winner is, uh, drum roll please, drum roll, drum roll, no. Grace Heffernan. <laughs> Master student in biomedical engineer and, and one of our in-person finalists. So congratulations, Grace. Congratulations again to all the best vi uh, recorded video presentation winners. Uh, we'll be reaching out about the uh, monetary award, not just the certificate, so stay tuned for emails. Uh, now I leave you with Dr. Brown. Okay, the judges have spoken. So we're ready to um, announce the results of today's competition. Um, the presenters will either receive a finalist award of $750 or one of the grand prizes. So will the finalists please come to the front? is announced for a grand prize, please step forward to accept your certificate and then afterward re return to the line. So um, the third place finalist for Grad Slam 2023, do you notice how slowly I'm speaking? Yeah. Um, is Kevin Hurtado. The second place finalist is Gabby Wynn. And the first place finalist is Abigail Schwartz. Congratulations to all of you. It takes such courage and a tremendous amount of preparation to compete in Grad Slam. So thank you, Grace and Kevin and Abigail, Enrique, Gabby, and Colin, for all of your work. You really are uh, exemplary representatives of the university and of your disciplines, of your fields. Thank you so much. So if you guys could stay here. But before Luis closes the ceremony, um, I have one last and comprehensive thank you to the person who is most responsible for every logistical detail of Grad Slam, from planning to implementation. Uh, his organizational prowess and collaborative skills are legendary among those of us who work with him. And without him, Grad Slam simply wouldn't be the success that it is year after year. So David Bradshaw, will you please come join us? Uh, You'll please come up to the stage, David, and accept this uh, indication of our appreciation and respect. There you go. Thank you so much. Share some words, wisdom. Oh, speech. 
Uh, well, congratulations, presenters, video presenters as well. Um, fantastic job. It's been great to see all of you grow in how you're presenting your work to the public. Um, I, I emceed all of the prelims, so saw where they started, where they've come. Also got to see all the other folks as well. Um, and it's, they did fantastic too. We've got some really great work going on here at the University of Arizona. And I'm glad we can use Grad Slam as a way to share that with the public. And it's really uh, heartwarming to see all of you in the audience uh, here today, supporting our students, uh, judges, supporting our students by having the, the difficult task of evaluating who gets the awards. Um, but being here and um, taking time out of your day to you know, hear about what's going on and what our future leaders and scholars are going to be doing. Um, I'll stop here because we, we do have a reception and I, I don't want to keep you from it. But um, thank you so much for being here today and um, congratulations to all, all of our presenters today, the world winners. And this, this marks the conclusion of the Grass Slam final round. Thank you, judges, for your participation, and thank you all who joined to support our students and graduate education. And now, uh, I won't keep you from the reception, so that way. Thank you all again. <laughs>